Hey, I'm Alex Radical from Board Game Co. And this is going to be a Patreon requested video. This is uh, one that is specifically about how to get games to the table. I mean, ultimately, you and I, or whoever, are constantly getting in new games. And the problem is we get excited, we get that game, we, we back it on Kickstarter, we buy it on our local game store, whatever it is. We trade for it, who knows, whatever the way we get that game. But we get excited, we look into a game, and we, we figure out this is the next game we want to get, and we, we get it. And it shows up at our door. And then it sits on the shelf for 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, 12 months. However long it might be. It might be years before that game is played, if it's played at all. So the question ultimately is, how do we ensure that we get games to the table? Now, on the one hand, I'm a terrible person to be asking this advice from because I have way too many unplayed games in my collection. It's a problem I'm constantly struggling with, and it's a problem that has only gotten worse as I have started getting more and more into content creation. At the same time, despite the fact that I have a lot of games on my shelf unplayed, I play hundreds of new games every single year, so it's really just a question of volume on, uh, over here, and, and at that, to that point, to that degree, I do get a lot of games played. And so I really have five tips that I have, and in classic board game co-fashion, I will have a, a little addendum tip thrown in there as well. And to start off with, number one, don't get games that will be hard to get to the table. In other words, don't set yourself up for failure. If you are someone who does not have eight people at your table, why are you getting Captain Sonar? If you are someone that does not like party games or your group does not play party games, why are you getting new party games? If your group does not like heavy, thinky strategy, why are you still backing the next sequel to On Mars or whatever it is? At the end of the day, know how you play games and know how your group plays games. If you don't play solo, don't get solo games. You may have one time played Terraforming Mars solo, and it was, a, it was a great experience, and it really is a great experience. And you sat there and you said, you know what, I will play solo games. And then you don't. And so you keep getting solo games, and you still don't play them. Because ultimately, when push comes to shove, you make a choice with how to spend your time, and if it's your three friends, you play a board game. But if it's by yourself, you end up pulling out the latest video game and hopping on that. Just because you play Terraforming Mars once solo does not mean you are a solo gamer. And that's true across the board to any of these degrees. Find whatever types of games are not likely to hit the table. Don't set yourself up for failure. Do not get those types of games. The next time you are on Kickstarter, looking at something that looks so appealing to you, ask yourself whether this is really a game that has a reasonable chance of hitting the table or not. And if it doesn't, don't back it or buy it or whatever, hoping that somehow magically the things will change, the stars will align, and you will play that game. And so that's tip number one. Don't get games that are hard to get to the table. Number two, capitalize on the excitement. I mentioned already, I talked about how you're excited. You want that game. You're excited to get that game. And this is where Kickstarter is not a good fit. Because when you're excited about that Kickstarter game, it's a year later, if you're lucky, before you have a chance to play that game. And so you can't, you can't branch down. You can't narrow that gap of excitement. Although there still is some excitement when it shows up at your door. It just might be mitigated from when you eventually, from when you back then bought it. But whenever a game shows up on your door, when you unwrap that box and you look at it, you pull it out, you take a look and you're like, wow, I just got the latest copy of whatever it is. I, guess I just bought Cubitos and you're excited. You're like, I like Cubitos. I want to get to the table. Well, capitalize on that excitement because I guarantee you as soon as it hits your shelf, the excitement will decrease day after day after day until eventually there's another new game that shows up on your doorstep, and that's the new excitement. Now you want to play the Lost Ruins of Arnak with the expansion. You're so excited and Cubitos is on your shelf forgotten capitalize on the excitement of a new game. Capitalize on the fact that when you back it, again, even when you back it, there is a gap, but still it shows up at your doorstep, you unbox it, those eight boxes of Bloodborne are sitting staring at you, and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to dive in. Well then dive in. Make sure to dive in. As soon as possible. Because the longer you wait, the new something else new and shiny shows up, and the less likely it is that games will sit on your shelf. I can't speak for everyone, but speaking for myself, I can guarantee you, the games that show up, there's such a huge percentage of games that show up right away that I get played, compared to as soon as it hits the shelf, now it's fighting an uphill battle. It's fighting upstream against the, is it upstream, downstream? It's fighting against the current that works. It's fighting against the current of new games constantly flowing in. I have to remember why I want to play Fury of Dracula. Fury of Dracula's been here for a while. Magnificent. I read the rulebook for Magnificent as soon as I got it, and it hasn't hit the table, and I need to get it to the table. Games will slowly filter down your levels of excitement, your levels of getting it to the table, just because it's the very nature of being excited about the latest, newest hotness, whatever it is. So capitalize on the excitement. And here's where we get to the addendum. 
two B as it were. Two B is don't get a lot of games at once. This is really just an addendum to the first rule, to the well, the second rule, the rule I just mentioned. The idea if you're gonna capitalize on the excitement, then getting tons of games at once will just make it inherently harder to do so. If you get a box of 10 games from your local game store, that's awesome. I'm glad you're supporting your local game store, whatever it is. But now you have to play those 10 games. How frequently do you play new games? Is it once a week? Twice a week? Even at twice a week, it's still going to take you five weeks to get through those 10 games. Are you still going to be as excited? Are you not getting new games for the next five weeks? Capitalize on the excitement goes hand in hand with getting a fewer games at once. Now, it doesn't mean you should only get one game. At the end of the day, online shipping, free, free shipping at $100 is a classic thing at most online game stores. So you might need to get three, four games. But cut it off at three, four games. Don't buy more games than the amount of games you can realistically play or try at one time. Order your games in small batches. And again, Kickstarter will throw a heavy wrench into this gears, into these gears because Kickstarter doesn't really let you plan accurately around when your games will show up. At the end of the day, those eight boxes of Bloodborne will show up hand in hand with 16 boxes of Marvel United and Arena of the Contest or whatever it is. All those things are impossible because those are all games that showed up at different times. But you know what I'm talking about. Hypothetically, games will show up all at once along with those four games that you bought from your local game store with your free $100 shipping, whatever it is. I guess online is not local game store, but your friendly online game store, whatever it is. But that's basically it. So again, don't get games that won't get played. Capitalize the end of the excitement and going hand in hand with that is get games in smaller batches. And number three, read the rule book and then read the rule book again. Getting games to the table has a variety of things you need to take into account and one, well, one of the most important things is going to be the ability to actually play that game. Now, never, ever, ever show up at a game night with, you know, your friends and they start pulling out the rule book and reading on the spot. Please do, no, please don't do that. I have, a, I have a video coming at some point about how to teach games and that will come up, but do not, do not ever try to teach a game on the spot, you learning it for the first time. Rather, get that game, pull out the Magnificent, read the rule book, make sure you comprehend it, and then read the rule book again so you really truly comprehend it. And then when you're ready, now that you understand what's going on, now you can get the game to the table. Because at the end of the day, one of the biggest blockers, there's a few more, but one of the biggest blockers to playing a game is going to be your literal ability to play it. It doesn't matter how exciting Bloodborne is. If you have to wade your way through a 30-page rulebook and you haven't done so yet, you're simply not going to play that game. And so read the rulebook and read the rulebook again and understand that you need to get that game played, which brings us directly to four. Set it up. Before or after the rulebook, set it up on your table. And this might be essential to the process of reading the rulebook, depending on who you are, depending on how visual you are, whether you need that tactile feel. And even for myself, I find that I vary. Some games I can read the rulebook once and I can dive straight in and teach the game. Other times I need to read the rulebook two, three times. And then other times I need to read the rulebook and have it set up on the table so that I can actually understand what's going on. But you want to reduce that friction. You want to reduce that barrier of you being able to play that game. And so comprehension is a huge part of the equation. Comprehension of the subject matter. Comprehension, not just your ability to understand, but your ability to teach is so key. Because if you are someone that teaches games in a painful way, and this will go hand in hand with that teaching video when I get to it. But if you are someone that teaches games in a way that is not smooth, and not a smooth process for your friends, then they won't want to play your new games. People want to play games. People want to play new games, old games, games they like, but they want it to be a streamlined experience. And if they have to break their teeth every single time, as you half teach, half reference the rulebook, check up these four errata, look up that, Google this, try to understand, well, I don't know what those tokens are. I mean, I know I read the whole rulebook twice, but I've never seen those tokens. That's not a good sign. It's just not. So set the game up. Once you're done with the rulebook, set the game up on the table. Walk through a few rounds if you need to. Do what you need to do to reduce that barrier so that whether you're playing it by yourself, whether you're playing with a spouse, a friend, a group of friends, whatever it is, you are walking in well prepared. Which brings us to number five. Know your group dynamic and know how to work around that. So speaking for myself, this is an interesting one because I don't have a full degree of experience with how this plays out depending on your game group. Let's take myself. Speaking for myself, I am the game person in my group. We have a group of people, we play games, but I'm primarily the game person. There's one or two others that have a few games, but realistically, 98% of the games we play are owned and purchased and acquired by me. Now, that does give me a degree of freedom over understanding which games will come to the table. Now, I'm not, you know, uh, 
a mean dictator or whatever it is. I'm a, be I'm a benevolent dictator. That's the word. I, I give my group agency over the games we play. I often say, okay, great, we have three people tonight, so these are the games that I would suggest, but if you any of these or anything else you wanted, go ahead, and I'll... I'll cleverly sneak in a few options of new games i'll be like oh and also there's there's these three new games that i'd love to try they're great with three so i always leave the options on the table but there is a degree of agency that i have over the options on the table a degree that i can push things in but that won't necessarily be true of everyone the upside of being the main game person is that i have the most control over the games that are picked again still with voting rights and still a group decision you do not want to force people to play games they do not want to play that is true across the board friends spouses whatever it is do not force people to play games that they don't want to play but alongside the the freedom and the, the of choosing the games that comes with the fact that i am the one responsible to buying all the games to acquiring all the games and so that comes that does come with a trade-off so to speak but know your game group know your dynamic are you a solo gamer can you get solo games to the table more quickly, more easily, where you might want to buy more solo games and ease off those four or five player games if that's not happening? Are you playing two players with your spouse? Well, then understand what games he or she likes to play and cater accordingly, buy accordingly, and suggest them accordingly. Your spouse, whoever they are, may like playing one new game a month. They may like playing three new games a week. Everyone's going to have a different level of tolerance for the, the new things that enter the table, and so plan your purchases around that. Again, this goes back to don't get games that, that will be hard to get to the table. While that's true in a broad form, it's even true within the categories that you can get to the table. You might have an easy time getting a two-player game to the table, but how many two-player experiences can you get in there? How many times is your spouse, your friend, your whoever willing to pull out a new game and play it? If you have a full-on game group, how, how many of them are trying to juggle to bring not only the games you love to the table, but the games that are new to them? Sure, you just got Bloodborne, but they also got, I don't know all the names of the games, but they just got Lost Winds of Arnak, they just got Nid of Alir, whatever games they got, someone just backed the new Everdell Kickstarter. Whatever new games are on the table, you might be dealing with four or five people that all want to bring their new games into the equation. And so you have to know your group dynamic, you have to play around that. You have to either negotiate, have a schedule, have some sort of system in play that, you know what, yeah, sure, Mike gets to bring a new game in once a month, I get to bring a new game once in a month, Susan brings a new game once in a month, you might have a rotation that you have to manage, you have to juggle, you have to work around. And then make sure that when it is your turn, you know the rules to the game, that you walk in prepped, that there is a degree of buy-in, do not push people to play games they don't want to play. Every time you play a new game, you are giving up a degree of... of What's the word for it? There's a degree of trust in that choice. There's a degree of trust that you chose a good game. And so also be wary of choosing games that aren't good games. Because every time your friends, every time your spouse, every time yourself, well, yourself is the, you usually have the most leeway with yourself, but every time your friends, your spouse, your whoever play games with you that they don't like, it's going to be a little harder to convince them next time to play that new game with you. Because now they're like, you know what? That last time, that last time you requested that game, and none of us like that game. And so you have to renegotiate, rejuggle. So know your dynamics, push and pull, understand the ebb and flow of the balance here. And so a quick recap. Don't get games that are practically not reasonable that you will get to the table. That's just setting yourself up for failure. Capitalize on the excitement of getting new games. And to that end, do not get too many games at once, too many new games at once, because it will be hard to realistically play them all. Read the rule book and read it twice. Know the game. Set it up on the table so you can really understand everything that's going on there so you're not teaching the game while trying to figure out, well, I don't know what that location does. I never really saw it. And then five, know your dynamic. Know yourself, your friends, your spouse, your whoever that you are playing with, your family too, whoever it is, your kids, whatever, whoever you are playing games with, understand who they are, what they like, and balance your new games and your scheduling of those new games around them. And that's basically it. That's how I get new games to the table. And I, I fail as often as I succeed. When I get a new batch of games, I, I usually get a bunch of them played right away. And then a bunch of them sit there and kind of ease their way towards the back. And that's why when I'm doing these monthly games leaving the collection videos, every once in a while there'll be a game in there that I didn't actually get to play yet. Because as time goes on, my excitement wanes. New games come through. People stop talking about that. And I'm like, you know what? I never really should have gotten that one. Because right now I just, I just don't care enough about playing it. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, have a good one.